Welcome to this Spotlight Series episode of Up and to the Right podcast presented by Signature Wealth Management Group. I'm your host, Russell Harris, along with my co-host, Brian Ransom, and our trusty Ian Payne here at Signature Wealth. Today, we have a special guest joining us, Mr. Samir Patel. Samir is a managing partner with Trophy Point Investment Group and is also an instructor of real estate entrepreneurship at Georgia State University. We're so excited to have him here today. So with that, let's roll the tape. Welcome to Up and to the Right, presented by SWMG, a podcast where employees and guests of Signature Wealth Management Group talk about what's new in financial news, financial planning topics that affect the everyday investor, and other relevant topics influencing the markets today. All right, Samir, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining us today, yeah, man. Yeah, glad to be here. Thanks for Yeah, for, appreciate for coming along. Man, I got to tell you, um, just a side note for those notes. So Samir is one of my fellow alum of West Point here. And we, uh, we knew each other a little bit at school, not, not too terribly close per se, but I think we've gotten to stay connected pretty well over the years. And it's been fun to watch your journey of everything you've been doing, man. You have been all over the place, really doing Thanks. a lot yeah, of fun it's stuff. Been fun. It's been, uh, I've been annihilated maybe a few times, uh, in the business world, but it's been fun overall. Yeah. Hey, I think that's how you learn in a lot of cases, you know, you got to take a little bit of risk sometimes and sometimes you fall, but as long as you keep getting back up to dust yourself off, I think you're doing just fine. So thanks. The question I cool. have for you is, have you paid your West Point alumni dues? My dues? Mm-hmm. I don't think I've paid them for this year yet, oh, actually. Oh, man, we've got to correct the local. Oh, but I, oh, I'll man. definitely definitely get on that. <laughs> I'm looking forward to some of the celebrations coming up. Uh, I'm hoping that Army plays Georgia Tech again sometime soon. That was fun to go to that game uh, several years ago. Yeah, that was. Came here and they came to Georgia State as well, too. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. So now... I assume you still went for West Point during that game, even though you're an instructor. At, I mean, we won't tell anybody. No, and I even had bets public. going on, and I lost both bets. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. That can be tough sometime with Army football, although they've been doing pretty good lately. So I've been happy to see what they've been doing. But, um, but anyways, um, so Samir, I mean, you've got an impressive background. You know, you're a West Point graduate. You led soldiers in combat. You went on to get your master's and an MBA you've really become what I would classify as a serial entrepreneur. You know, you've been involved in a lot of businesses over the years. Um, So we're really just dying to learn about your journey. But before we get too far into it, can you tell us a little bit more about your background? How'd you get into all this? I think I've always believed in in being a leader, Mm -hmm. and I've always felt very strongly about solving problems. And those two core ideas translate really well into business and the military. And so largely I've been in a situation where I've always wanted to be in. Either I'm leading something or I'm helping create value in a business sort of sense. And my mind just gravitates toward that stuff. I um, don't know anything about dancing. I don't know anything about art. I don't know anything about like, you know, the softer side of the world. But uh, when it comes to this stuff, my mind just gravitates toward it. And, and that's that's translated into the many things that you, you're about to get into. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. So I remember reading, you know, a little bit background. I didn't even know this until a couple of years ago, but you even made your first real investment move while you were still in college. That's right, yeah. All right, you bought a hotel or something like that? I did. I bought my first hotel when I was a junior at West Point. Uh, so USA Bank, as you know, Brian, USA Bank gives all the cadets a $30,000 loan at 1% yeah. interest. And you don't even have to pay that back for 18 months. So... Really, it's free money for 18 months, and you can't help but make money, even with just natural inflation. And I've always felt that I need to learn how to make things happen. And I've always wanted to build assets. You know, there's a lot of books out there, especially at the time in 2007, where this idea, which is a very well-worn topic, but it's still incredibly important, is you want to build assets that throw off cash flow. That's a traditional or a definition of, of asset. And I wanted to build assets. And... I got this $30,000 loan from USAA and I asked myself, what can I do with this money? I don't want to buy a car with it. I definitely don't want to put it in any, any sort of depreciating asset like a car. And so I started asking a bunch of people what they got for real estate. And somebody said, hey, this couple's divorcing. The judge is kind of forcing them to liquidate their hotel. It looks like a good price. Would you be interested? And me and my big mouth said, yeah, sure. <laughs> Not knowing much about what I was getting into. And plus the hotel was in Waukegan, Illinois, right? So Oh my goodness! Five, yeah, six states away from, from New York, and um, and then I went on the other campaign of raising the money for it, and I eventually, you know, helped with a backer. We he guaranteed the SBA loan with me, and we bought it. And then 
That was in 07, and we didn't make any money for five years because 08 hit. And back then, survival sort of success was de- was defined by just surviving, not necessarily yeah. even making a profit. Yeah. Um, so I learned a lot um, from that experience. The first dead body I ever saw was at the hotel before my deployments to Iraq and Afghanistan. Oh, my goodness. Um, one of the key lessons I learned was that nobody cares that I went to West Point, in, at least in the business world. Nobody cares what school you went to. Nobody cares about your rank or anything like that. All they care about is are they getting a paycheck and are you creating a good environment for them to work? Sure. And give them a reason to come back to work the next day. Yeah, definitely. You know, it's interesting. That's a good point with leadership. Um, And that's something I learned throughout my career over the years is the old saying, no one cares what you know, right? Necessarily. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. They, they, uh, they want to know that you care. And that is so true. I mean, it really is. I mean, I've been through so many uh, pinches over the years, if you will, and the team is what brings you through um, that you're leading. But I, I think that's because you got to have good leadership skills and, and work with people closely. You know, the other thing own. I've learned is that it's so it's such basic stuff. Like, you know, it literally is leadership by walking around and just asking about people and being present and finding out what they're up to and what's going on in their life. And that gets you 50, 60% of the way there, believe it or not. Yeah. And I think when you translate in business as well, this is something that I'm sure many of our listeners could relate to. And I'll just take, and I'm, I'm kind of going on a limb here. Uh, but for example, the hotel, right? You bought this hotel. You didn't know a whole lot about managing a hotel necessarily, right? You bought it from an investment standpoint. And I imagine you probably learned a lot from the folks that work the front desk of that yeah. hotel. Yeah. I used to give up my military leave and work the front desk you know, myself a little bit. Yeah. And that's how you started learning the business, right? Yeah. It wasn't that you went to school for hotel management or anything like that. It was getting down in the trenches and, and learning the business. So uh, that's pretty awesome, man. So, um, so you, so you did this while you were still in the military, you started investing and then you, you know, looking at your background, you've been involved in a lot of different businesses, right? I, I saw things like credit card processing and, um, I think I saw uh, credit repair, trucking. How'd you get into all these different businesses? Yeah, so I don't know if the term serial entrepreneur is a good term, to be <laughs> honest. I, uh, I would rather be a one-time entrepreneur where okay. like, you, know, you make enough. a lot of money from one, one business deal. I think that's preferred. Uh, but for us, uh, for us dummies, as I'll call myself, uh, I just have an intense curiosity, and I just found myself like really exploring and meandering the business world to kind of find my fit, my, what I really liked from an asset allocation perspective, my time perspective, what I'm good at managing, what I'm not good at managing. And so I think one thing I credit my father with was he always set an environment, you know, as we grew up, like that mistakes are okay. Mm -hmm. And that it's okay to make mistakes. It's okay to, to try a lot of things and it's okay to fail. And, you know, the more important thing is you just, you know, keep trying. Right. And so that's what kind of what I found myself is like, I was just so enamored with business that I just found myself excited by a lot of ideas, which is good for someone in their, you know, twenties and maybe even early thirties, but I wouldn't recommend that for someone that's in their mid thirties, mid forties. That's, that's the time I would define as a time for focus. But I, I just love the idea of, of how money works and how business works. And so I just got myself in all this trouble and, um, Yeah. And eventually like, you know, after like all that, all those adventures, I realized that lending and private credit is, is what I like most. And that's what I've been able to scale over the last few years. Yeah. So, so that's been interesting. So you you really kind of were in a bunch of different businesses trying to figure out where your fit was and you ended up landing basically in private lending, primarily focused on real estate from my understanding. And so you're, you're now with this group, you know, Trophy Point Investment Group, which I love the name, Trophy Point, right? Thanks, Coming yeah. little West Point uh, analogy there, or what am I trying to say? You Reference? know, we actually started Trophy Point in 2015 with, with three other partners, three of my classmates, actually. Okay, wow. And initially, we were just doing real estate deals on our own. Like, we, you know, if a deal called for $100,000 and we didn't have it, we'd just 25, 25, 25 and make it an investment yeah. and, and do that. And then eventually, people started asking, West Pointers started asking for loans, and so we would do a lot of deals on handshakes, actually. Wow. And so Trophy Point was just for West Pointers initially, hence why we picked that name. Yeah. Uh, but now we've obviously become much larger since then. So what is the reference there of Trophy Point? Oh, yeah. Thanks for asking. It's a monument on the Academy grounds. Uh, there's like this big, tall statue or obelisk, I guess. I don't know what you want to call it, but like this yeah, big, I think tall it's about thing right. with a lady on top. 
Mm-hmm. And that area where it's situated on is called Trophy Point because like the view is amazing. And then like we've got all these trophies of 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 defeated enemies of the United States. We put their cannons and stuff like that. Oh, nice. Yeah. Around that around that monument. It's, it's oh. right at the spot. It's it's actually coined the million dollar view of the Hudson River. So yeah. A little history lesson. West Point, the name refers to a bend in the Hudson River, a western point of the river. And back in the Revolutionary War, that was a very strategic spot because you could, uh, sailing ships have to slow down tremendously right. to turn that bend. And the, uh, the Americans realized very quickly that it was a very strategic point. So they fortified that area and they put a big chain across the river and put a bunch of spikes in it and, uh, defended it, preventing the British from coming up. Because really at the time, if the British had, they basically would have divided the country in half at that time, Mm -hmm. uh, the way it was was posted. Plus, it's only about an hour, hour and a half north of New York City. So a very, very strategic point. And um, it's actually the longest garrisoned U.S. military installation in the country. Really? Um, Yep. So it's it's been there a long time. That's also the area where, uh, although we don't like to mention his name, Arnold Benedict uh, had his uh, treason. Mm-hmm. He tried to give up West Point to the enemy. Um, a lot of history there. If, for those of you listening, I don't want to go too far into it, but if you have never looked it up, I think it's definitely a, yeah. a neat uh, piece of American history. So This isn't uh, hardcore history of Dan Carlin. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit of different subject here, but uh, but it's, it's fun. So I, I love the name there. Yeah. But um, so you, you, you got into private lending, um, and then also started teaching real estate entrepreneurship at Georgia State. How'd you end up with that gig? So after the last business, going back to 2019, I sold my logistics business. And, you know, there are a lot of mistakes I made in that whole episode. And I realized that now is the time for me to, like, upgrade my education and go back into real estate. Um, so keep in mind that in 2010, 2011, 2012, I was already doing private lending, actually, on commercial properties, was adding to my hotel portfolio. I owned a debt collection business that collected debt on HOA um, HOA debt, actually. Oh, interesting. Um, and then I meandered with stock trading, with uh, credit card processing, some other businesses, and then I went into trucking. And I realized after the trucking business that, uh, or the logistics business, and it was 65 trucks, and so, you know, substantial. Uh, I grew from 2 million revenue to 9 million revenue. Wow. 2017 and 2019, and I sold it. But there were a lot of strategic errors that I made in that, mainly with regard to finance, actually. And I think finance, especially in today's capitalistic society, uh, governs 80% of the returns that you get. I don't think operational excellence is, is what it once was in terms of creating value. Anyway, I learned all these things, or at least these are these are theories that I had in my mind about how value is created in the world. And so I'm like, I should go back to school. So I went... And I had time and I had, you know, some money laying around so I could afford to do it. So I decided to get my master's in commercial real estate at Georgia State. And it's a one-year program and it's basically uh, at nights, Mondays and Wednesdays. So I was in class Mondays and Wednesdays from 5 p.m. to 10 p.m. And uh, that program, I had a lot of fun. I, I learned so much. I reinforced a lot of my own working theories that I have. It uh, opened my eyes to different you know, different ways of thinking and things like that. And I, I credit that program with turning my life around or at least the direction I was going professionally. And I had so much fun. They invited me to come back and teach actually. Wow. That's pretty cool. The student becomes a teacher. Yeah. I'm a proponent that, you know, you should not rush into getting a master's degree right after undergrad. I think there's something to be said about waiting four to seven years, four to 10 years after undergrad to go back and get your master's because then I have real context. Like when the instructor's saying something, I have like a, a life experience that I can attach to that. Yeah. That makes the learning so much more fun. And me, knowing me and all the adventures I've had, I've I've been in every almost every situation. I've been I've been suing people, I've been sued, I've done all sorts of things, all sorts of situations that you could name probably at this point. And it was just so much fun to like be able to like complement the learning with these experiences that I've had. And I would tell instructors like, Hey, what would you do in this situation? Knowing kind of my own little case study of what happened and hearing their perspective. And in some cases I was vindicated in some cases I was dead wrong. Yeah. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And that's, that's what education is about. Yeah. That's how you learn. That's pretty awesome. I would say as you know, myself having an MBA, 
waiting that extra five to seven years, getting your career experience, it makes a big difference. You know, I, I actually have two master's degree. The first master's, I jumped immediately from undergrad to master's with no real world experience. And I think that was, uh, that was a mistake. And I, didn't, I, I still, to this day, don't really use that master's degree. The MBA, however, you know, clearly I'm here, been using that MBA ever since. So, um, yeah, I think that real for for you future um, MBA students out there or masters of whatever, it's worth getting the career experience and the life experience and waiting. Yeah, no, I would agree. I mean, I, I did the same. I didn't get my MBA until several years after undergrad, and um, yeah, and I agree with you. I had a very similar you know experience where I was able to apply what I was learning to either what was already going on in my world at the time or you know to past experiences, um, but also. I think it's true that there's a big difference between classroom experience and real world experience. And one does not always translate directly to the other. They definitely mm -hmm. complement each other. So if you end up with too much on one side and nothing on the other side, you're kind of right. lopsided in some ways for sure. Yeah. And the best master's programs won't even accept you directly out of undergrad. Oh, so, someone even uh, yeah. accept you. So if you're looking to get that ROI for, from your master's degree, it's worth waiting. Yeah. yeah. You know, the sense. other thing I'd add is Georgia State, at least the commercial real estate program, prides itself on having instructors with real world experience. There's actually only one PhD that teaches in the program. Oh, yeah. But the rest of the instructors are all practitioners and they all take time out of their day to come teach, right? So they, they own their own funds, they're running their own deals, they're, they're, they run their own shops. And that's amazing too. And I think if you're going to pick an MBA or master's program, you want to look at the instructor mix. Yeah. The PhDs definitely are important, but if you're looking for a more practically minded program, then you want to go to a program where it's taught by by real practitioners, right. people in the business. That have done it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, that it what inspired awesome. me actually. Like I, I really enjoyed that and appreciated that about it about the about the program. And they inspired me to say, look, I should come back and teach and and give back as well to the program. Yeah. yeah. Well, even to speak to that, I mean, you know, I just graduated undergrad at UGA and the best class that I took my entire undergrad experience was the last semester taught by, uh, it was a private equity class they had just oh, started. Cool. And it was taught by someone that uh, was a VP at a private equity firm here in Georgia. And it was, you know, not PhD. She just wanted to do it. And it, I got the most value out of that class that I got out of any class my entire time at UGA because it was someone that was taking the concepts and then applying real world experience or real situations, giving us case studies that actually happened. And we could go back and review what happened based on the decisions that were made versus what we thought should be made. And it was the most value I got out of any class at UGA. Yeah, that mm -hmm. makes sense. That's pretty awesome. That's pretty awesome. Um, so, you know, kind of getting into where you are today, I mean, what, what would you say are some of the biggest successes or maybe failures that led you to where you've landed at this point? I think the overarching theme is that, you know, if you don't know what you're good at or you don't know where your fit is, I think the failures are actually necessary. And in that sense, the failures have become a success because it allowed me to gain a bunch of experience in a lot of things and then overlap these sort of mental models into like this ladder or lattice almost. And now I've, I've created a company trophy point. We do private lending, but trophy point is really the amalgamation of a lot of concepts layered on top of each other, Yeah, which would not have occurred had I not gone through what I did in the past. And I also, you know, I got to give credit to my partners, Nick and Dave, my classmates. Um, they've been with me through that the whole journey as well. So they have seen my evolution and have stuck with me over the last eight years, nine years actually. And together we have created this company that overlaps a lot of these concepts. Yeah. And they all stem from failures, to be honest. Yeah. Um, and I would say it's also, it's not a absolute thing. It's a relative thing in the sense that you've got to determine if you want to be an entrepreneur, you've got to determine how your worldview and how your personality fits with the business and the market itself. Like I like to sell, I enjoy being in front of clients. I enjoy talking to people, learning from them. And that trans translates really well to like raising money. Like I've had to raise like about a million dollars a week for the last six months Wow! to keep up with, with what Trophy Points growth has been. That's good for me, right? But if another person that doesn't like that, you know, private lending or that business would not be good for them. Right, right. So it is about finding the fit more than anything else. Certainly. 
Do you mind um, diving in a little bit um, on what exactly private lending is and kind of starting yeah. from the ground up and maybe explaining the differences between Trophy Point and, say, going to a bank and taking out a loan? Yeah, I'm glad you asked, actually. And so it's very important these days, too, that private credit, private lending is now probably the darling of the of the investment world, maybe. Um, but, you know, basically you can borrow money in two different ways, maybe three, diff- three, three ways, actually. You can go to a bank, you can walk in and talk to a loan officer and fill out an application and the bank will take all your information and they'll go to a credit committee and, you know, a month, two months, three months later, you'll approve your loan or not approve your loan and all that. The second way is you can go to Wall Street, you can go borrow from like what's called known as CMBS, right? A mortgage-backed security where Wall Street packages up the money for you and you now pay Wall Street, basically, you borrow from them. That's CMBS, it's MBS, these are all mortgage-backed securities, right? And the third way, which my way, (laughs) which is what I do and my preferred way, is you borrow from private individuals or private groups of people that are not Wall Street or not a bank. And we're not regulated, we're private under the SEC definition. Uh, Typically, we're all Regulation D type funds. Um, And so it's just really you're borrowing from a a group of people or one person. And we get to set the terms of what we like to do and we're not really beholden to anybody else as on the lending side. We pick our clients that we wanna lend to, we, figure out what geogra- geographies we want to lend to. We figure out like what we like, don't like, and we get all enormous flexibility. So, you know, when you're talking about it, you know, as kind of an asset class, you know, you have two, two sides to it. You have the clients who are borrowing money from you and then you have your investors, right? So you talked about raising money. Obviously you have groups of investors that are pooling money together to be able to lend it out. So how, how do you mitigate that risk? How do you work out your underwriting you know, because I imagine the risk, of course, is that you loan money to someone and then it falls through and you don't get your money back somehow. Well, that's the art, right? That's yeah. why you want to. That's why you want a sponsor like myself that has been around the block and has lost a lot of money, and we know, like, we What's know a good deal for? when we see one, and we know a bad deal or a bad situation yeah. when we see it from the get go. Uh, but typically, lenders, I mean, have some form of collateral, right? Like, it depends on the type of lending you do. Uh, I also owned a uh, government contract lending business as well. And so I would lend on the receivables from the government contract. And my collateral would be literally the assignment of the contract or the proceeds being assigned to me. And that was a form of collateral. The government would pay me first. And then I would send the net proceeds back to the borrower after I got you know paid back. That's one way to do it. Another way in real estate, which is the tried and true method, is you take a first lien or a lien on the collateral itself. Mm-hmm. Right. And you have to be able to ascertain, can I seize this collateral to pay back our principal plus any carrying costs, plus any, you know, cost it takes to, to, to like foreclose on somebody. And so you're, you're basically kind of acting as the bank mm-hmm. for folks, but you're just private. Yeah. And the other thing that, you know, to, to Brian's, uh, um, question, the second half of it is people come to us, borrowers come to us because we don't, we don't, force them through the red tape and the hassle that banks do. Like we close loans within two weeks. Like from the time someone calls us to the time we've actually closed their deal is sometimes 10 to 15 days. We've closed deals within 24 hours, actually, when a bank has started like all of a sudden failed to perform. Banks want a lot of paperwork. And I think a lot of it's because the loan officers themselves are not real estate owners. If you're a loan officer and you know how to evaluate an asset and you know how to do a rehab, chances are you're not going to be a loan officer. You're probably going to be in business for yourself. So the banks are not inherently equipped, in my opinion, to do this type of stuff because people need money fast. Good deals don't last that long. You need someone that gets it, that can understand the value just like as, as you do if you're the borrower and be able to act quickly. And there's a huge need for that, right? That's why we exist. And that's why we charge higher too for the for the service. The service, yeah. So, and, and primarily the folks coming to you to borrow are for real estate investments, right? My particular fund, yeah, we do first lien only type real estate on single family and multifamily properties. So we'll we'll do up to 350,000 on single family fix and flips and rental properties and then up to a million, 2 million on multifamily properties. Gotcha. So really folks probably come to you especially if they're having to rehab it or something like that because they can get money fairly quick based off what you're saying. Now Rehabs they have the money are, to do what they got to do to get it, you know, long term. Yeah, rehabs are a particular challenge for banks and other lenders that are institutional because 
they like stabilized properties with predictable cash flows. Sure. And if you look at this from a finance perspective, you're really just trading in cash flows, right? That's what finance is at its core, is finding out the cash flow, how stable is it, or vol we, you, we call it volatility in some cases, and what does that mean for the investors? And typically what Wall Street and institutionals do is they just arbitrage it, right? They mm. charge you X, and they pay themselves Y, and there's a delta, right, based on the cash flow stream. They like stay, all I say all that to say that Wall Street and banks like stability. And if you're trying to create value, chances are there isn't stability. And that's why you need lenders that can understand the value creation and, and how cash flow streams can be realized over time. Gotcha. And so you're really, when you're analyzing this, you're, you're looking not just at where it is at the moment, but where you would expect it to be based off that person's yeah. business plan and things of that nature. And that comes from experience and time right. and, you know, ability to know if that's possible or not yeah. or yeah. And it takes some guts too, right? Because I know that every borrower that we lend money to, if they fail in their project, I can take over and I can fix their project and right. sell it off myself. You could do it for them basically. And yeah. Gotcha. Okay. That makes sense. So that sounds very interesting. I think some of the other questions that we have though, is kind of how the current environment is impacting your business, right? So mm -hmm. I'll start off, for example, with interest rates, you know, interest rates with the Fed raising interest rates, how has that impacted you? Positive, negative, and, and, and how do you see that affecting you long-term? Let me ask you this from your seat, where do you okay. think it's done? You think it's negatively or positively impacted us? Well, it obviously depends on your perspective and which What's direction yours? you go. Uh, I would think it's neutral to be frank because you obviously where interest rates are at, you know what your you know, risk-free rate is for lack of a better term. And therefore you can determine what you have to charge on the back end. I think the only piece that may hurt you is it can limit in some circumstances what someone can borrow, right? Before when they're looking at it from a cash flow perspective, they have to cash flow more on it in order to be profitable because the cost of borrowing the money to get there is, is higher. That would be my guess. So it's, do you want to take a shot at it? Yeah. The, the, my guess is you probably have um, a few more opportunities than you otherwise would have because uh, lending officers at the banks have been tighter and tighter on the amount of credit they're willing to lend to consumers. Um, and, uh, you know, people, the demand for, especially for people my age and younger, to want to buy homes is still very high. Um, they just don't necessarily, they, they need a little bit more help from somebody to be able to, to be able to purchase their first home. Yeah. So I would say Brian is more correct. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, the banks, so interest rates are really just a mechanism to remove liquidity from the markets at the end of the day. Right. Right. M2 money supply was very high for obvious reasons. Um, now they're trying to take money out of the money supply and the way the fed does it is through banks as you guys probably know. So they want banks to lend less, right? And what it's done is that it's opened up a huge opportunity for private lenders, private credit now to fulfill that shortfall. And that is what is happening. Our volume has, has basically increased substantially. We're on track to probably do 75% more loans in volume, at least than we did last year. Wow. And we did $40 million of loans last year. Um, this year we'll probably hit 60 Maybe maybe seventy five million. Wow. Maybe even a hundred. Depends. It's still we still got four or five months left in the year. Um. All that being said, we reject more loans too. So you're more correct in one sense is that we also want to look at the back end because I have to consider who is the end buyer, who's my real exit on this. Right. So to your point, it is who's going to be the buyer, and can the buyer afford the flip? or the rental property as is on the back end nine months from now when my borrower wants to exit. Let's say they're flipping a property. I have to consider that. And so what we have done is we've we've dropped or increased our standards of the LTV, meaning that we'll lend at a lower LTV. Yeah. Um, so we now have a more choose your selection of loans to make, and they're actually in some ways more high quality because I don't have to compete with with banks now for for these loans, I get to really say what we want to lend. Yeah. Do you mind defining LTV for the audience? Yeah, LTV is loan to value, right? Everybody, you know, it's a pretty basic term in lending, but it's really, you know, loan to value, it's a percentage of how much I'm going to lend against the 
perceived value of the property. And value can be defined in a number of ways, right? Like you can use an appraiser, you could use comparables, you could use the income approach, you could use the replacement cost approach, you can use all these approaches to valuing a property. And that is that is an interpretive thing. Sure. Um, we use a comparable based approach. We like to see properties that have traded within the last three months of uh, comparables of that have traded within three months of our subject property, meaning that like, is there an existing market for these homes right. lately, right? Because the interest rate environment has altered how property trades in in various cities and markets. And it's a very hyper-local game on top of that. So uh, we like to be more conservative. So we lend about 65, 70% of LTV of the after repair value of what we think the property is going to be worth after the repairs are done. Gotcha. Okay. So what do you, um, what is your perspective on what the housing market has been doing over, you know, the, it was obviously very hot in 2021. It was very cold in 2022. Where is it at in 2023? Uh, it depends on who's, who's defining it hot and cold. Uh, I think the buyers, I mean, yeah, it's been tough for buyers, right? Uh, which is good for, for us actually. Um, good for sellers. Yeah, it's good for sellers and it's good for lenders too, right? Because it props up the values of our underlying collateral. First of all, uh, I would say that it is sort of shocking a little bit what's going on. So we actually contemplated pausing lending, um, late 2022, early 2023. But then it emerged because, you know, typically, you know, if you just look at it from a math perspective, if interest rates go up, asset value should go down. And that is happening for a lot of asset classes, especially office, uh, maybe even hotels, def maybe even retail, a lot of things, right? Because the value goes down because the borrowers can, can only afford so much of debt service when the interest rate cost is higher. Right. But what's happening in residential real estate is that, a lot of people, if not everybody, I mean, kind of have to be dumb not to have done this. But in between 2019, 2020, 2021, there was a lot of refinancing going on at 2.5, 3%, 4% rates. I mean, my mortgage is 2.8%. At that rate, I am unlikely to sell maybe even forever, right? And that's the story that's playing out for a lot of people today is that they've got all these, they've got debt at such low rates that they'd be dumb to sell, to be honest. And the only thing that forces them to sell is death, divorce, or, you know, the typical life situations that force you to sell a house. So I, I think what's, I say all that to say that inventory is lower because there's less willing sellers because they've got this cheap debt on their properties and they just don't want to sell. Mm -hmm. And so that's what's going on. I mean, the United States, depending on who you believe, says that we are short three to five million housing units. Yep. Um, for people, which you, we've talked about this several times before on this podcast and in our, our mar market update videos, but that's a, we are constantly living in the shadows of the global financial crisis in 2008, right? Where they were building two, 3 million homes a year. Mm. And, um, I'm not sure if that figure is right. That might be a month. Um, but you know, the, the, the building, the housing starts was so high in 2006, 2007 and cratered in 2008, 2009, 2010. And it just never recovered. We never got new homes. We lost out on a decade's worth of new homes. And now finally millennials and Gen Z are ready to buy and there's no new homes to buy. Yeah, and on top of that, you know, there's this thing called NIMBYism that's going on in a lot of markets, which is not in my backyard, which is what it stands for. And municipalities are less likely to approve housing development because they want more luxury housing or they want housing that supports greater property tax rolls. And that's cutting out a lot of people or a lot of homes that would have been bought by people, you know, because the average income in America is probably 50 to 75K for right. the vast majority. And, and a lot of existing homeowners don't want supply in their own markets. Yep. So. Yeah. Tell me about it. I live in Athens, Georgia, and it, I don't think they've had a new housing development in years. Really? But they will start a brand new student apartment like every other year. Wow. So. Yeah. So you've got all these things layer on top of each other. It's created this sort of situation where there's a lack of housing supply and 
Do I see it unwinding? I don't think I see it unwinding, at least over the next five years. Mm -hmm. uh, I hope I'm wrong to some extent, but also I'm benefiting from my fund at least today on that, on those dynamics. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it is interesting how that supply demand curve really yeah. has played out over the last 10, 15 years since 08. Mm -hmm. um, I know I see a lot of construction where I'm at, but it's almost like they can't build homes fast enough. I feel like they're getting filled the minute they build them. So, yeah. And you've got metrics, like anybody can look it up, right? Like you go into a market and you look up average days on market and homes, depending on the market are being scooped up pretty quickly yeah. within 30 days. The vast yep. majority of them. Yeah. They're still moving really quick. And the other metric we look at is, uh, what is the final sale price as of, as a percentage of, of initial listing price, right? So you want, you want to see, you know, homes selling for 99%, 98% of their list price. You know, before, you know, 2021, homes were going at 103, 105% of list price, meaning that they were getting offers higher than, right. than they initially listed for. And that was a signal of how, how competitive it was. And 98% of list price is still pretty good. Oh, yeah. Actually. It's really yeah. good. Yeah. So I guess the end result, you know, interest rates shot up from two and a half to, 7% on the mortgages on the 30 year. Uh, economists were expecting some sort of, you know, housing sell off, which you somewhat got, you know, housing is down year over year. Um, but the end result is because of the demand from the younger generations, the end and, and the lack of supply within the housing market, the end result is the housing market is remarkably resilient. Uh, housing starts to starting to tick back up. And uh, home prices are starting to tick back up. Yeah. Well, remember in 2000, you know, 2004, 5, 6, and 7, leading up to the financial crisis, the underwriting on getting people into homes was pretty terrible, right? You got the ninja loans, which is no income, no right. job. You know, you got all that. And that's what caused the great sell-off in 2008 is people couldn't afford these homes because they shouldn't have been in the homes right. in the first place. Right. Now, fast forward to 2023, we've had stronger underwriting in homes. And on top of that, we've also added about probably 25, 30 million more people as a country, too, in terms of population. But coupled with what Brian said, not as many housing starts. So you've got all these other competing things, and I think that's why housing is, is resilient, and that's why we're playing in there today. Yeah. Now, if it wasn't, then I wouldn't be playing in it, right? I'd find some other asset class to lend money on probably. And right. Um, I'm just grateful that I have an opportunity, and I'm at the right place at the right time right now to, to take advantage of what's going on. Yeah. That's awesome, man. Well, I'm, you know, we're definitely uh, happy for you that y'all are doing well. Appreciate you coming in and Thanks, yeah. sharing a bit about your background and what y'all are doing. Uh, if folks want to learn more about what you do, how do they how do they look up Trophy Point? Yeah, just go to trophypointcapital.com and all our documents are there, our track record and all that stuff is there. We've done almost $100 million of loans without a single default. Oh, wow. Across 460 loans. And so we're very proud of that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then you have access to all my quarterly letters as well. And so I, my quarterly letters are usually six to eight pages long. And I think maybe only one out of 10 people read them out of my investors. I've got 150 <laughs> investors. But for the 1% of them that do read it, I, uh, you know, I enjoy espousing my thoughts on, on a lot of the stuff we just shared today, actually. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. Well, I really appreciate you sharing with us today. Any final thoughts? Yeah, I would say that, you know, you, it depends on who you are, but if, if you're someone of wealth and you have, you're not worried about any like existential crises like, you know, divorce or death or health or anything like that, I think this is a good time to pause and reflect on like what money means to you. Because what I've noticed, and I, you know, I'm in the same business as you, right? Like I am raising money from people and I'm trying to convince them to allocate capital to me. Mm. And you guys are probably trying to convince people to allocate capital across a variety of asset classes using your expertise. And I think the single biggest thing I would tell older or, you know, investors or people with means is like, you don't want to risk money you have for money you don't need. And I see a lot of investors getting like caught up in this relativism, like, oh, the one asset class is giving us 15% or, or potentially projecting 15% returns. This one's only giving us five, six. This other thing over there is only giving us seven to 10%, like my fund. And I, I would say, just think about what your real goals are and what the real money, what the money actually represents. Because it's not about the money, it's about what the money helps you do. Right. And I think you'd want to allocate your capital in ways that helps you live your life and not get caught up in, 
and trying to earn like two, three extra points of yield. I don't think it actually matters. In my opinion, obviously, you know, a compounding graph will tell you otherwise, but I don't think two to three points of extra yield with extra volatility is worth it in these times. Yeah. I think you want stability and I think you want, you know, an area where like the money is protected. Yeah. It's a good thought. It's a good mm-hmm. thought. Well, great. Well, um, thank you so much for joining us today, man. I really appreciate you coming on and sharing Likewise, with our audience. Yeah. And I think we all learned a little something today. So really appreciate that. Um, and for those folks listening again, you know, feel free to check out Samir and his group there. Um, and as always too, if you're interested in learning more about our firm, uh, what we do, who we work with, et cetera, just visit our website, www.signaturewmg.com. Uh, and you can also access the contact us page to reach out, ask us any questions or let us know who else you want to hear from out there. We'd love to have uh, more folks on the podcast. So thanks again for listening. We look forward to checking back in next episode. Y'all have a good one. From all of us here at Signature Wealth Management Group, thank you for listening to the Up and to the Right podcast presented by SWMG. We hope you enjoyed the show and we welcome you to continue to tune in as we release new episodes. In the meantime, you can stay up to date with relevant financial news by connecting with us on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We are Signature Wealth Management Group on LinkedIn and Facebook, at Signature WMG on Twitter, and at Signature Wealth on Instagram. You can also visit our blog on our website at www.signaturewmg.com slash blog. We look forward to your continued support and engagement. The information in this podcast is educational and general in nature and does not take into consideration the listener's personal circumstances. Therefore, it is not intended to be a substitute for specific individualized financial, legal, or tax advice. To determine which strategies or investments may be suitable for you, consult the appropriate qualified professional prior to making a final decision. We suggest you discuss your specific tax situation with a qualified tax advisor. Investment advice offered through Signature Wealth Management, a registered investment advisor. Signature Wealth only transacts business in states where it is properly registered or is excluded or exempted from registration requirements. Information presented or believed to be factual and up to date, but we do not guarantee its accuracy and its publication and are subject to change. Information should not be regarded as a complete analysis of the subjects discussed. All outside guests of Up and to the Right podcasts are not affiliated with Signature Wealth Management Group and their opinions are their own and do not reflect the views of Signature Wealth Management Group. Past performance is not indicative of future results.